Peace and greetings. Presenting the Network of Awareness Podcast Radio Station. Providing in-depth information on society and culture in America and abroad. Bringing you truth messages of inspiration, keen insight, reputable interviews, and so much more. So now, for the truth you've been waiting for, your host of the Network of Awareness Podcast. Aura! Aura! The Informationalist. 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 Peace and greetings, folks. This is Aura the Informationalist from the Network of Awareness. And yes, we got a great show lined up for you today for season five. And of course, season five is a banger where I told y'all that I'm bringing you nothing but some great interviews with people from around the world, from different walks of life. And today we got a show in regards to that, where we got a brother who is a man of the most high, first and foremost. He's also a family man. And uh, we got an actual police officer. Now we've had officers from Sheriff's Department, Corrections, we even had uh, probation officers on here, but not, we've had police officers, but never an active duty police officer. So I'm very excited about that because the brother is still um, an active police officer and none other than in NYPD, right? New York City. So we're going to bring on Richie Baez, also known as Brother Lamont. And... Um, he is from the uh, documentary that is on Hulu that has gotten a lot of attention. It's called Crime and Punishment. And he is the, the chosen 12. He's one of the chosen 12 in the documentary of officers that had the courage to go against the uh, New York City Police Department. So we're going to have him come on the show. We're going to talk a lot about uh, some of the things that went down in that documentary, as, lo- as well as the purpose for the police, right? Because that is today's episode, the purpose for the police. And we're going to talk about some of the things in the documentary, as well as we're going to talk about the, the history of policing. We're going to talk about, you know, things that have gone on since then, since that documentary was released, because the police department has gone through a lot of changes and continues to go through it. And we're just going to discuss a lot of things that are very controversial when it comes to the NYPD and very controversial when it comes to policing overall, especially here in the United Shenanigans of America, because... As we all well know that when it comes to policing, it's very biased and people of so-called color wind up getting the shit end of the stick when it comes to policing, unfortunately, for many, many reasons. We're going to discuss all these things. And I think it's great that we have a direct source, not only from the documentary, who's one of the, the 12, but also just an actual person who's in the mix that is trying to do right by the community, but is part of an organization that is um, that has had a bad name on it for quite some time through the history out here in the United States. So let's get this show started and we're going to give them a warm welcome here like we always give our guests here at the Network of Awareness. So let's give them a warm round of applause here. What's happening to me in plain English with, without the mumbo jumbo? You are now tuned in to the network of awareness. To the network of awareness. 
Yes, yes. Welcome to the show. Richie Bias, brother Lamad. How you doing today, brother? Shalom to you. Hey, I'm doing well, man. I like to give uh, all praises to the Most High and my Lord and Savior Christ for blessing me to be in your show, you know? Yes, it's, a, it's truly an honor to have you on the show. And uh, this is historical for me right now because... Um, I never had an active, uh, you know, active duty police officer on the show. And um, it's it's one of those things where um, I've had police officers on the show, but they've all been retired. So you're the first. So we're making history here. And a lot of my listeners on the network of awareness is very it's very mixed emotions uh, when it comes to police. You know, even with me, like and I've I had this uh, personal conversation where it's like. I don't really have a good outlook on police, but I do respect those that respect me. But unfortunately, I haven't had the best experiences like a lot of people and there's other people that have. So the people that are going to be listening, um, just understand that when it comes to police officers, not all of them are bad. okay? (laughs) but I think that the organization sometimes when it's run by certain people, um, it can go in a certain direction where um, and just like what we're going to talk about in crime and punishment, where it's like they compromise even the good people that are in the organization or in the in the police force to do certain things that um, I would deem as very unrighteous. And that's why we're going to talk about what you brothers and sisters did in crime and punishment, because it took a hell of a lot of courage. But before we do that, can you just let the listeners know? Um, just a little brief uh, bio about yourself um, and, you know, who you are and what you do. OK, well, my name is Richie Bias. Uh, you can call me the brother of the mod. I'm an 18 year veteran with the NYPD. Um, I wanted the lack of better word, stars in the crime of punishment. And basically, I have my family is of Dominican descent. They came over here during the 70s when there's like a lot of upheaval in Dominican Republic at that time between people that were what they call communists and people that were called communists was basically people that wanted to unionize the workers, have a five day work week, eight hour work day and be paid living wages. So they were labeled communists. So they were shooting, uh, killing. The government was killing a lot of my family members. So we came over here for pretty much safety. We grew up in Spanish Harlem. If you don't know, that's the east side of Harlem, a.k.a. El Barrio. Uh, I currently still, I currently work in the South Bronx, which covers Cypress Avenue, Brook Avenue, uh, my Haven area. And I've been there ever since. And like you mentioned earlier, I'm a married man, uh, father of two beautiful girls. And most importantly, I serve the most high in Christ. All right. Thank you, brother, for that intro. And um it's it's interesting because we got we have listeners in the Dominican Republic, so we have one of your own listening, or should I say that are that is gonna be on the show. So for all my brothers and sisters in the Dominican Republic, uh we have one of your own peoples here. And also we got one of your own peoples from Harlem, right? Um so we have listeners from both of those places. Mm. And um we do have police officers that <laughs> listen to the show as well. Mm-hmm. Um and hopefully more will listen after this show. So uh, first things first, I always like to start from the beginning with my guest. And since this is your first time on the show, can you let the listeners know um, what inspired you? Like, so let me ask you this question first. When you were a child, did you always want to be a police officer? Yeah, it was either being a police officer or a pharmacist, believe it or not. Those like wow. the two <laughs> things I wanted to be. Well, wow, those are two uh, so, different occupations, or, or should I say two different occupations that are very different from each other to want to be. Yeah. Like I always like I always like the James Bond type uh, movie. So I just want, want to be something like that. And the pharmacist, you know, I like science a lot. So what basically changed my mind was in high school. And once I took chemistry and physics in high school, I was like, oh, my goodness, this thing is I really need to put the effort into it. And seeing that I didn't put the effort into it, I went to law enforcement. So there you have it. OK, and good. So you so you actually achieved your childhood dream of, uh, of yeah, the profession you wanted to get I into. Did. That's that's great. And, and believe it or not, it took me a long time to get into uh, the police department. Because being very young, I was in like in my early 20s. My mentality wasn't there, you know, especially even though I was believing in Christ, I was following the faith and everything. My mental I wasn't mature enough at 21 because if I, I was trying to get in in 1998. But 
you know, I wasn't focused, partying, doing things that I wasn't supposed to be doing. And, you know, I got kicked out. I came back a few years later, focused and determined and graduated and went into the police academy. But I'm glad I went in at the age I did at 27 instead of 21 because I was a completely different person, a complete 180. You know, and the Lord did that for me basically to deal with a lot of stuff that the average person really shouldn't be dealing with, you know, because to be a police officer is really a calling. It's not just a paycheck. Because you really have to put yourself, other people before you, you know, because when you go to answer a job, you're not answering jobs that people that are singing and happy. These are people that need really, really big help. You know, sometimes you go into domestic violence and I seen some very, very disturbing images that I cannot get out of my head. And seeing these things and going to the scriptures, like, why are we going to this? Why do we have all these type of curses coming upon us? It's because we broke the most highest commandments. You know, mm. it's like Deuteronomy 28, when it says, when it says the the man, the, the brother should hate his brother and the wife should be against the husband, the husband should be against the wife. It's so true. You see it in like in 4K and 3D every day. I mean, I've seen instances, not to get too graphic, but we, a man uh, man was jealous of his girlfriend and he took a broom, broke it in half and the shard, the, like the pointing one, and put it inside his uh, girlfriend's uh, private. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we get there, it's a bloodbath. It's a bloodbath. And the toxicology, the toxic, the tox, the wickedness, but like this, the spiritual wickedness that's binding them. She protected him. She claimed that she just fell on it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And like who's going to buy that story, right? Yeah, exactly. And pretty much if that's what she's insisting, you know, what can we do to really punish that person? That exactly. person's going to get away with it. Yeah. And it's, it's not an easy job. So being a police officer, what you do, you see the evils of mankind. Like you see the demonic forces that are behind people, not only in the community, but also working within the department. Because a lot of stuff that you see there, like when an officer is abusing our people or anybody in general, it's because that guy has a, a demon inside. And that demon is, I want to hurt you. I want to say, prove to you that I got more power than you and I'm better than you. You know, well, because, let's 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 ahead. talk about your your perception growing up in um in New York City, like myself and many others that are listening in. Um, and I was talking about this uh, with another guest of mine, um, a brother that you know very well by the name of Dawad. Where it's like, you know, when you're growing up in New York City, um, you're it, it's really just you know, Hispanic and black people. That's pretty much what it is. Anybody that's of Caucasian white descent, so to speak, they're usually the teachers, they're usually the police officers, firemen, but they're not really in New York City like that. They they have patches, right? You have like Drag's mm-hmm. Neck in certain areas where the Italians live, but primarily it's black and Hispanic. So what was as um, a, a Dominican male growing up in New York City, what was your perception of police growing up? How did you view them based on your experiences with them? Well, growing up, even though I said I wanted to be a police officer, I had a lot of bad experiences with them. You know, you used to constantly too. getting stopped. <laughs> uh, <laughs> constantly getting stopped. Uh, I even had a police officer steal my cell phone from me. <laughs> you know, I was like, well, these freaking guys. And, you know, some call me like a, a no good Dominican, you know, freaking drug dealer and stuff like that. I don't like, so I'm like, I want to be a cop, but man, these guys are a bunch of a holes, you know? Yeah. It wasn't until I went to a black party in Washington Heights and I saw these two Italian dudes and the way they acted was so cool and so chill. And I saw how everybody in the community loved them. I was like, you know what? It's not really about the race, it's the person that's behind that badge. That's if right. you're a good person, before you become a police officer, you're going to be a good person as a police officer. If you're a douche, uh, you're going to be a douche as a cop. Matter of fact, it'll magnify it because now you have a power behind it. You have authority behind it. How old were you when you had that experience of viewing those two Italian officers? I was like, uh, let me see. I was a teenager, like 12, 13 years old. Okay. And since you mentioned the wad. We had, me and him was coming out of, uh, I think it was uh, one of the class, one of our services. And we was walking home. And we usually walk from the west side to around the wild. He grew up on the upper west side. And as we walking by, I think 106, 107th in Amsterdam, like, you know, back in the days, it used to be hot over there. 
we got stopped by the plainclothes officers. They had their guns out and everything on us. And I was like, okay, they had their guns out. Must be something serious. And what happened was it must have a robbery happened. So they had uh, the victim come in the, in the police car, the unmarked. And it was, uh, two Jew- it was a Jewish couple that was there because I saw the, the, gar- the garments. And the curls. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't have the curls. They had oh, the, so they the weren't, head covering uh, and the yarmulke. So they weren't Hasidic. Okay. They, right. they weren't Hasidic. So there was like, it wasn't us. So everybody put their guns away except this one white officer. And what he did, he took his gun and pointed at my friend's Corey's face and just kept it there and kept it there. And I'm counting. I'm like, yo, what the hell are you doing? And his partner, a Puerto Rican officer, looked at him and just walked away. And I swear to myself, I would never be like, I would never be like that officer. And I'm talking about the officers that walked away if I ever became a cop. And this happened like around 97, 98, around that time period. So in the 90s. And that right there helped set the groundwork for me to do what I'm doing today, speaking out about the injustices within the police department towards our people. So that's like a, a nutshell is how it was uh, in the 90s getting stopped. And even as a police officer, it's getting stopped. I had an incident when me and my boy, we coming out the my building and he had a nice, nice Mustang, beautiful. And we see the police car across the street and me and him looked at each other and said, you know, you're going to stop us. He said, yeah, we know. And he used his click, click. So, you know, we had the keys to the car. We had our academy uh, gym shirts. So if you're a police officer, you recognize that's from the academy. So they came whoop, as soon as we got inside the car, boom, stop us and interrogated us. And we was like, yo. Two white officers like, yo, what what a complete a-holes, you know? They know that we are we're cops and they still stopped us. Mm. They still want to interrogate us. So we have guys like that that leave a very, very bad taste in your mouth, you know? And I had incidents, incidents uh, when I'm in the train station, I'm dressed up. I'm dressed up nice. I had a poor appearance. And I'm in the train and I lift my arm. I'm a right-handed, so I keep my pistol on my right arm on my right side. So when I lift up my arm, you can see the pistol. I wasn't aware because I was so tired. And I saw three cops come in. Two of them were rookies, Dominican cops. And the guy that was training them was a senior cop, a white guy. So I saw that I made eye contact with the two rookies and they was like, oh, my goodness, like very scared. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I'm going to have a bad day real quick right now. But the senior cop, the white guy, he looked, he asked me, hey, am I uh, in our slang term on you on, on, on the job? I was like, yeah. And I said, oh, what command? I said, told him the command. And he said, OK, cool. He said, yo, just make sure that, you know, keep that covered. I said, oh, cool. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. And again, it goes to experience and what type of person you are. It would have been those two rookie cops. It would have been a bad day for me. That more experienced cop, he knew because the body language, the way I was dressed, he didn't look at my skin color. He looked at the whole attire, you know, mm. the whole attire. It's like similar to me and you walking down the block. Yes, because we see a person of color. We're not going to see, we're not going to assume that he's going to try to rob us. But as soon as he sees us, he put his hood on and, you know, put it real tight and starts reaching. He's like, OK, now now something else. He's trying to rob us. It's all about the body language and how you carry yourself. It's like the scripture says, you should know an ecclesiasticus, you should know a man by his gait and la- excessive lapper, laughter. The gait is how he carries himself. You know, if he carries himself as a man of the most high, is he carrying himself as a demon? It's all by the way he walks, talks, and moves dress. Yeah. And that's that's also street smarts, right? When you're in New York City, you kind of have to be aware of how certain people move, the environment that you're in. And you only know that through experience and, and having that intuition to say, okay, uh, it, something seems off here or there's nothing to worry about here. And uh, you can only gain that through experience. So I think it's very important that people of the same ethnicity should be policing people of the same ethnicity. Um, It's a big it's a big deal. And a lot of people don't take it seriously. I noticed that um, growing up in New York City, um, when I had moved up state already when I was an adult and I moved up to Orange County, New York, that was the first time I really got to be around a lot of white people. And it was Mm -hmm. a big culture shock for me. But I noticed that a lot of people from upstate New York in Orange County, like New Windsor, Newburgh, um, even like Rockland County and and further up, uh, Dutchess County, Poughkeepsie. You had these white police officers that drive down to go work in New York City. But the environment that they live in is not like the environment that they work in. Uh And that creates a major disparity in the perception 
of how they view the people from the city opposed to the people that they live around in the suburbs, which is more primarily white. Now, a lot of my listeners know, based on, you know, the education that I've given on this show, that race really doesn't exist. It's just a a social construct that was created. But for the purposes of the show, we have to talk about racism because through the perceptions of many people's uh, cardinal eyes, um, racism does exist. It's become a reality, even though it's based on a lie. And because of that, I want to talk to you about uh, talk talk with you about that in regards to racism. Because you made a point where you was like these cops saw us in our uniform, uh-huh. but still messed with you. Where you yeah. would think that okay, this is one of our own. Like they're gonna leave you alone, right? Makes sense. Yeah. But no. What do you think? Um, when, you, when it comes to racism, because in Crime and Punishment, it was something that was talked about a lot. Um, it was talked about how they wanted you guys to have summonses and put citations on specifically black men. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And of course, Hispanic men, because a lot of Hispanic men look like black men. It's like we're one and the same for most of us. I mean, a lot of us don't look too much different from each other. And it's something I talk about a lot. You know, like even for yourself, if... For the for the average person that doesn't know anything about Dominicans, okay, and and I love when Dominicans say "get by now," <laughs> uh-huh. uh, you know they don't know. They look like a, a let's say a, a a man from from out here in Florida, from the south. If they look at you and you're out here in Florida, you they're not like, "Oh, that's a Dominican," you know. Uh-huh. They're gonna be like, "That's the N word," or "That's you know, that's a black man." Yeah, you know? I experienced that when I lived in Orlando. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, you already know what it is, right? So yeah. can you talk a little bit about how racism is a big problem in the police force when it comes to policing and how they, the people from the higher ups wanted you to target uh, specific ethnic backgrounds? Yeah, this is how it's done because racism is has different layers. One is the promotion above captain, above captain. Because the one thing my uh, my de- police, my department talks about how racially diverse it is, but they don't say how racially diverse, and but they don't go into how above the rank of captain, it's still 85% white, even though whites make up probably either 50 or maybe a little less than 50. So the question is, why is it 85% white? Because that good little boy network that they have, they put the most, their own peoples first. That's right. And then those black and Latinos that fall in line, you know, the house mouses, the plantation people, they go up next. Anybody that's trying to shake up the system, they can only go up but so far. And the way they tell they tell uh, officers to basically go and when they go to the inner city, like the Mahavens, Havens, the Castle Hills, the Soundview, Spanish Harlem, Washington Heights, East New York, Flatbush, they don't say go after black and Latino. That specifically what they say, everybody here, a bunch of savages and criminals. <laughs> So savages you keep on hearing the word savages, 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 savages every day. You're going to look at people, they beneath you, you know, because you got a shield, you you have a gun, you have the power to arrest and also the power to kill somebody, you know, and take people freedom away. So that type of mentality going out there is what the racism is. They don't say specifically black and Latinos. But they'll say, get these criminals. They, everybody here hates you. They don't work. They all on welfare. And having that mentality right there is bad. Now, referring to the crime and punishment, that particular supervisor, who was now like a three-star chief, now kept on getting promoted, <laughs> even though he's on tape saying the most racist thing in the world. He was calling tape saying, I want you to stop blacks. And departments protected him, say, oh, it was taken out of contact. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because this, what the story didn't uh, cover was that Pete, when he, Pete was having a conversation with uh, that commanding officer, he said, you don't have any uh, 250s. Now, to put it in layman's term, a 250 is uh, stop and frisk. He didn't stop anybody. He said, oh, I stopped somebody in my haven. The same area you want people to get stopped. Yeah, there's a white male with red hair because he was wanted. He matched the description of a white male with red hair that robbed somebody in the neighborhood. He said, that's not good enough. Mm. He didn't want that. So if they would put that in the news like that, then you would say that it's racist. But they only put the clip about, oh, he just want black males between 16 and 24. So it's the way they manipulate the information. 
is very crucial. And what they want in a police department, if you have any type of spirituality, any type of faith in God, they hate it because you know why? Like a guy like me, I don't won't conform to their policies. I won't follow anything blindly. I'll question. And they hate that. Well, that makes sense because it is a draconian institution. And it's interesting how you said the plantation, the house mouse, right? And I know exactly what you mean. And a lot of the listeners know what you mean by the house mouse. You know, it's it's interesting how the overseer during slavery times is what transitioned to what's now considered a police officer. Uh-huh. And back in the 1800s, when the when New York was forming, and you saw this in the movie Gangs of New York, where police officers were hired. The purpose of a police officer was to protect the property of the socialite elites within uh-huh. the community. And those are the people of wealth. So the police officer's job was to keep that wealth and property safe from the savages of the streets, which at that time was a lot of what you call native um, native Europeans that were there, you know, your pilgrims and Anglo-Saxons. Mm. And then, of course, you had the Irish come over who were treated very poorly. They were con- they were considered like they were considered like the black, like how black people are considered today. And um, you also had racism, of course, you know, you had lynchings and all of that. But that was the purpose of the police department was to protect property. And it really wasn't to serve people. It was to serve the best interests of the socialite elites of those times. And then, of course, it gradually grew into a, a bigger department serving more people. But the foundation of that still remains true to this day. It's just different because we have a large we have a much bigger society now. Things have changed with uh, modern day society. But the purpose of the police force still has that nucleus tied into it, where it's like they're the overseers, just like during the the slavery times. Um, Something that I saw in the documentary that I'm not going to say it upset me, but it irritated the hell out of me was when (laughs) when Sandy Gonzalez was talking to um, the brother on the street and he was like, hey, let's go get a cup of hot cocoa and go talk. And he's like, I can't, maybe later, you know, because they're watching me. And then you see the sergeant, which is two white guys, you know, and they roll up on him and telling him that he shouldn't be wearing his hat, that he's out of uniform. And he and they said, oh, you can't wear a hat if it's above 32 degrees. And I love what Sandy said. He said, well, when I started work this morning, it was <laughs> under 32 degrees. <laughs> But what I saw, what I found interesting in that scene was the disconnect that they had with Sandy. And uh-huh. I see it all too often. Like even when he was like greeting them and saying, hey, you know, OK, take care, guys. You know, they, they didn't even talk to him. They just completely ignored him. And it, it, it kind of boiled my blood a little bit because I've seen that so many times, that disconnect. And it's like. See, somebody like me, I couldn't I couldn't be a police officer because just that alone, something that small would irritate me and and, and bother me that I'm, you know, talking to you and treating me like I'm lesser than you, where you Uh can't even acknowledge me. And that's what happened in that scene. It was like whatever Sandy was saying didn't even matter to them. Their goal was just to harass him because that's probably the the assignment that they were given. There's like anything he does that is somewhat out of order, check him on it. You know, and that's what they did. I mean, for his hat, come on now. But the fact that they didn't even say goodbye to him, they didn't say hello. It was just like, well, listen, this is why we're here. Let's get this done, you know? And I see it all too often. Um, It's funny how you said that man has now ranked up (laughs) the guy who made those comments. What's his name, uh, Hayek or something? Well, you talk about the sergeant that went up to Sandy or the No, the sergeant officer? that went up to Sandy, but the guy, the, 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 the officer or that was of higher rank that made the comments over the phone on the recording that he on made comments. Yeah. yeah. No, his I think his name was Hayek is, or something or Hatak or something or Hayak. Hayek? No, McCormick. McCormick. Okay. McCormick. The sergeant that, that was bothering Sandy, that was Sergeant Black. And <laughs> I won't go back to what he said that he said that it was after Sandy. I remember during that time period, my ankle was messed up. So I was working inside. So I heard him and the lieutenant 
talking, Lieutenant Hackey. They say, hey, I want you to make uh, to make sure that Sandy and Officer Fomovich make sure that you make their life miserable if they don't come back with any numbers. So if the hit was out for them, mm. you know, mm. and there was a way for me to get full duty so I could put the hit out for me. <laughs> It's it's such a, it, you know, when I was watching a documentary, it, it brought back so many memories, you know, growing up in New York City. Um, to me, the police department in New York City, like many of the police departments around the country, but New York City being the, the largest, one of the largest police, actually, it is the largest police off, uh, department in the world. Yes, it is. Um, and I found it to be interesting that Puerto Rico is not too far behind you guys. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. The poli- uh, police uh, department? Po- yeah, yeah. That statistically, there's a lot of police in Puerto Rico um, and a couple of other areas around the country. But obviously, New York City being the largest. And then, of course, you have Los Angeles, which they have a, a history all by themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to the police departments uh, or when it comes to New York City Police Department, and all these memories that came up, I, I feel like um, it runs just like the military. And the only difference between you guys and the military is that you're not sleeping overnight in a barracks and, and spending that time isolated from the rest of the world. And that's why in the military, there's a big problem with rape. And it's not just with women, it's with males too. A lot of men get raped. It's the, it's the untold secret. Um, And it's because everything is governed within the organization, within the institution itself. And that's a big problem. And it's a big problem in the police force because it's like even with internal affairs, it's like internal affairs is internal. So there's no outside source regulating the misconduct of the institution. So when you have the actual that's like. That's like us regulating ourselves all the time, you know? Yeah. It doesn't uh, make sense. It's like we're always going to we're always going to give leeway to ourselves or or if there's a, a institution like the police force enforcing itself when it's uh, when it's conducting misconduct. It's like, how does that even work? Because it doesn't work in the military. So it sure doesn't work in the police force. But yet it is the foundation of the institutions and how they run. And it has yet to change. Yeah. Like. How can I explain it? It's digress a little bit. The military, uh, uh, the police department is called is considered paramilitary, meaning that it's operating on similarly as a as a military. The ranking system is similar. The marches, the drills, some of the tactics is based on the military. So now a lot of the BS that the military does, they also do with the police department. So with somebody, something like the Eternal Affairs, they're not really there to fight corruption. They're basically there to keep people quiet. Because like one of the brothers uh, in the documentary, Adele Bolanco, he was forced to, to write things that he didn't see. And when he made that complaint, they asked him, hey, do you have a copy of that? He said, sure. He showed a copy and they punished him. They didn't punish the supervisor. They punished him. And I was like, wow. You know, so that's the type of uh, foolery that we deal with. And also like the history, like you said, the police department is based on the slave uh, plantation patrol. Yeah, the overseer. It's based on that. Mm -hmm. It's based with that. Also formerly in the military and also it's copied from uh, London Metro Police, how they police. So basically London didn't have plantation. (laughs) You know, they didn't have no plantations there. So they took the elements that existed here and put everything they had and create the police department in the mid 1800s. Absolutely. And like you said, it's there to protect the property. And to this day, it still is because we're here to not only protect the property, but to generate revenue for the city. That's right. And speaking of generating revenue, what was the amount of during that time of that heavy duty corruption that you guys were exposing the 12, um, which I called the chosen 12? Um, what was the amount of citations that they were requiring you to provide on a monthly basis to beat whatever quota? What was the quota that mm-hmm. had to be met? January was uh, one in 20. One arrest and 20 summonses. In a month? In a month, yeah. For each officer? For each officer. Now, I want you to explain to the people what happens when you're under that number. And I want you to explain what happens to the officers that exceed that number. They give 40. Because I know there were some overachievers. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was uh, a lot of kiss asses. I mean, overachievers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Basically, what happened was this. 
if we didn't make your your quarter, well, dude, they'll that you, they'll make you ride with a supervisor, and they'll pick the most smelliest, stinkiest, homeless person that they could find, and they make sure that they have a whole bunch of uh, shopping carts worth of stuff. So your punishment will be to arrest that person because they'll just, they'll legally search him to see if he had crack, and nine out of ten times he has some type of illegal drugs on him. They'll arrest them and they had a voucher every item that they had there, everything. So he'll have hundreds of stuff. So in the rest that might take you two or three hours would take you forever, 10, 12 hours to process, you know, and that's what it'll do to punish you and to be an example. Now, those that were overachievers, because it was all about quantity, not quality. They will get to ride with the sergeant, the easier post. If there's any openings to a specialized unit, they'll get it. And it's not because they were good officers; it's because they do, they'll do what they were told. So that was the that's how it worked. Because I give the thing with Amado Diallo, when that uh, unit was first started, basically it was cops, very experienced cops that dealt with get that had numerous arrests of taking guns off the streets. So they were experienced. So what happened when that program was so successful? They wanted to expand it, and when they expanded it, they started bringing in. Their friends, the kiss asses. So people that had no experience and getting guns off the street, but they was bringing in numbers, they was pulling that team. And that team that was working that day when Amadou Diallo got killed, they never worked together, ever. Brand now, new he, they, he got killed? I thought he survived. Amadou Diallo? Yeah, I thought he was the one that had the, uh, the baton. The 41 shots? Oh, okay. I, I, I got the... Who was the man who had the baton stuck up his anal, his rectum? That's Abner Luima. Okay, there we go. Okay, so do I... Yes, thank you for clarifying that. I was a little confused on that. Yes, he was the one that was shot. The, the gentleman you're talking about, the brother, he, he got shot a bunch of times. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the, the Amadou Diallo. Yeah, Diallo. So now you have officers that should have been in that unit, never had the experience because nepotism based on corruption, which produces racism, got Amadou Diallo killed. Mm. Can we talk a little bit about your experience coming into the academy and what that was like for you and what was your mindset coming into the force as, you know, as a rookie? As a rookie, I was blessed. That had a little insight about how it's going to be an academy that the whole idea was uh, to break you. Just like the military. <laughs> Just like the military. So what they didn't like about me, I had my facial hair. I had a rigid accommodation. I also have a rigid accommodation not to work Friday nights. Oh, from the jump. From the jump. I, I don't know. I'm an Israelite from the jump. Got you. Okay. You know, so it's, it's not in them hiding. <laughs> you know, it's from the jump. I'm an Israelite. This is my faith. And they hated it. They hated it that a rookie, especially a, a black Latino Jew, <laughs> can have a facial hair. And these guys that have been there forever have to shave every day. They hated it. They hated the fact that they didn't work Friday nights. So every day they made their life, made, they were trying to make my life miserable. But you know what? I pushed through. I knew what it was doing. And made it to pass, uh, graduate the academy. And how? What was your experience within the academy in the training? And how long is that, by the way, for the for the listeners? Uh, it's six months. Okay. And basically, it's it's divided between academics and physical tra training and tactics. And I'm glad you mentioned it because we had a sergeant there, racist, racist. He worked out of East New York, originally from a cop, a cop in East New York. And what he used to say was this, you better work out because when you see those guys in the corner and they, in the hood doing pull-ups on the, what do you call it? On the, on the tough, at the. Oh, you're talking about the, the, the traffic, the traffic light, the traffic, the traffic lights traffic that merge like a triangle. Yeah. And you, you grab doing yeah. pull-ups. Yeah. They're doing that because they're trained to fight you. I'm like, what? <laughs> what the hell's wrong with you? I do I I used to do that. I wasn't even thinking about fighting a cop. Yeah. Or if you're doing so it I'm on like, the monkey Yo. bars, they're tra training to fight you. Yeah. So you're already setting the stage that black and Latinos are there to hurt you. They hate you. Kill them if you need to. He and said in those exact also, he said in those exact words, kill them if you need no. to. Just implying that, that they're working out to fight you. Okay. If they wanted to fight you, they wanted to kill you. Okay, I understand now. All right. You know, so that's what he's applying. Another thing he used to do was he was he'll, like, uh, 
you will let certain group of people go uh, to go to the uh, locker room to change earlier, like 20 minutes earlier. So if you could get there earlier, it's less people in the shower. You could change more comfortably. So he'll say everybody from Long Island and Staten Island, whoever lives in Long Island, Staten Island could go. So the majority of the people that went were white. <laughs> of course. Yeah, because that's the majority of people that live in Long Island. Yeah. And Staten Island. Yeah. So I'm like, yo, I, I already saw it. How, how oh, from the academy they teaching you what it is, what they expect from you. That it's, it, you should it's don't support your people as long as you wear this uniform. You one of us until a certain point. So they were segregating within right off the jump. Then they they right was already the, setting the tone of what you're being introduced to. How did that affect you when you were experiencing that? Because you know, and the reason why I asked you before you answer that question is because you. You know, if I'm coming into something that I'm just starting out as a career, right? And I'm, I'm looking at it from the most positive perspective that I possibly can because it's something new and I'm, I'm coming in with that vigor of I want to do right. I want to, you know, I want to make an impact. I want to change uh, like a lot of like a lot of us. We want to change the world. We want to make the world a better place. Right. We want to make the streets safe. If, if you're coming in with that mentality. So what was how did you take that when you started to see that right off the jump? It, it all goes back to the scriptures, you know, because we broke the most highest commandments. We should be on the on the bottom and uh, enemies could be above us. And me understanding that helped me push through and also reading the scriptures about our forefathers that were in law enforcement, like like Zerubbabel. And we read the book of the uh, first Ezra in the, in the Apocrypha. He was one of the king's guard and being the king's guard today would be secret service. Also, when John the Baptist was preaching, you had the publicans and the soldier that came up to him. And the soldier asked, what should I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? John the Baptist didn't tell him to quit. And mind you, he's a soldier in the Roman army. They didn't have CCRB. There was no complaint report. You can't cover up uh, police brutality. If you get your ass whooped, just be lucky you're alive. And what? And John the Baptist said this, do no violence, with no vi accuse nobody falsely, meaning set people up, no police brutality, and be content with your wages, no extortion. Me having an understanding helped me push forward. Knowing that I would be the difference between helping somebody when they're going to a very, very bad moment in their life to being something catastrophic instead of being helped. So that was like mentality. And, you know, dealing with brothers in that system is when you're by yourself, it's a heavy zone. You know, it can cause you to be depressed, it can cause you to be sad. And sometimes I question, why am I even doing this? Mm. That leads me to my next question. Um... My brother was a correction officer for 12 years until he, you know, resigned. Um, and, uh, you know, he took whatever pension that was vested, that he was vested in at that time. And it was a lot of reasons that he did that. Um, but it was the same question, like, you just asked yourself, why are you doing this? He would ask himself that. One thing I've noticed is that the man that my brother was before he got into correction is not the man he is today. I I've seen you. a major shift in his personality. Um, I've seen a major shift in the way he views the world now. I've seen a major shift in the way he perceives everyday people now that didn't exist before he got into corrections. And the question I ask you is, have you changed from before you was a police officer, the, the man you was that was being rooted in the word to the man you are now being in the police force for now over 18 years? Have yeah, you changed significantly? Changed. Yeah, it definitely changed. Because again, you never got exposed to the same things I exposed. Is put it like this: work in the South Bronx, where you see hundreds of sh victims that got shot, people getting raped. The average person don't see that, and you seeing that, and you see people in that trauma, seeing that body, is you will develop a PTSD. It's similar to somebody that went to Iraq, did two tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. That guy is not the same. Oh, absolutely not. Yeah, he is not the same. It's consistent, years doing consistent that. trauma it's that you're trauma. experiencing on a regular basis. Like you yeah. were talking about with the with the guy who broke the mop stick and you know and stuck it into his girlfriend. It's like if you're seeing that over and over again. And I grew up around police officers, and I've heard stories about finding babies in microwaves and all types of horrific stuff. We've seen the movies. You know, they show you certain movies where. Cops experience certain things that they have to walk in on and stuff like that. Um, so how do you keep, I mean, um, how do you keep level-headed by experiencing all that trauma? Like, is there, 
I know that there's counseling for police officers, but do many police officers seek that counseling and therapy on a regular basis based on the experiences that they're having on a regular basis? No. That's a problem. <laughs> it's a big problem. And until recently, it was very, very ostracized. If you have a mental, if you need counseling and you go get it to the department, you're going to lose your job. It wasn't until the last few years that we had a slew of officers killing themselves. And it wasn't just officers. It was men of prestige, men that were renowned within the department, killing themselves like chiefs, inspectors, first grade detective, which is close to impossible to get, killing themselves. A lot of these people killing themselves a few weeks before, a few weeks or even a few days before retirement. You're like, what's going on? You know, they even changed. Uh, they even change uh, the the terminology. It says instead of saying committed suicide, it's, they say die by suicide. Because when you hear the word commit, it means you're doing something wrong. You know, you broke a comm- a commandment or you did a crime. Like thou shall not commit adultery. You know, thou yeah. shall not murder. So they changed it. But before the job doesn't really care. It's like uh, it's like I said before, the NYPD is a whore pretending to be a lady. Wow, you heard it here first, folks. The NYPD <laughs> is a whore trying to pretend to be a lie. I like that one right there. Wow. As they try to paint this virtuous woman, you know, with the long dress, the hair modest, they talk elegantly, they walk very daintily, but behind closed doors, they're the biggest whores in the world. They wake well, up isn't, isn't that you know? the perception that the United States gives to the rest of the world? Oh, yeah, this is the 100%. place where you can achieve all your, your wildest dreams and anything is possible. But in reality, that's why I call it the United. I call it the United shenanigans of America, because it is a country that is really a corporation. It's not even a country. And it's based on a long, long legacy of lies. And the whole entire foundation and the fabric of this country is based on lies solely. That's it. This whole country is a lie. And we're exposed to it every day, but you don't know that until you come here. That's why a lot of um, so-called immigrants come here with big dreams. And then they're like, wait a second, what the hell did I get myself into? You know, man, I speak to people from like Eastern Europeans from Albania and they show me their houses like mansions and they hear breaking their back. I say, yo, why are you breaking your back over here? Go back to your country. Save up what you need to save up and go back to your country. Because that's how, I guess, say Dominicans were when they first got here. Their mentality is, this is not my country. This is not my home. I'm born here to make money. And once I make enough money, I build my house. I set up a business. Yeah, I'm out of here. You know, I'm just going to use it for what I need to get. But over the decades and generations, we started to settle here. Our mentality was to build more here. But like during my parents and grandparents uh, days, that was not their mentality. That's right. To build anything here. But what happens to them is they become very Americanized, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I've I've even experienced that with um, with the uh, Puerto Rican and Dominican cultures because I've dated um, Dominican women that were very humble and meek, but then they get a little taste of America and that uh, American society and um, they start becoming like American women. They start mm-hmm. with they, they start becoming very materialistic mm-hmm. and wanting <laughs> way too much. Um, and it, it, you know, it's like it's, it's that it, it's almost like America is um, it's a very toxic place. That if you're not spiritually grounded, it, it really that the, the 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 temptations can take you down a dark path. And that's for anybody. Doesn't matter how strong you are. You know, if you stick around long enough, you know, you really got to be very you, you got to be very balanced in righteousness because the you know, and I'm doing a show with Brother Aqua Rai about it. The mechanics of sin is very, very strong here. Yeah. Very strong here. It's, they teach you the steps how to do it while you're realizing that you're doing it. You know, it's like uh, how they change from a uh, horish apparel. Oh, it's sexy. You know, it's not homosexuality is alternative lifestyle. So they change <laughs> the words. Yeah. Something to make and give it a nice sounding word. So it doesn't sound bad, you know, and that's what this country is about. And same thing with uh, NYPD. It's not quarter. It's performance enhancement, performance goals. <laughs> they change it. It's the same thing, you know. Yeah. And which the way the city is going now, they're already requesting officers to start getting numbers again. The last, so the last five or six years, they never, they never asked publicly to put officers to the side because before, when I was a rookie and coming up prior to the lawsuit, they say, hey. 
Bias. Yeah, if you only got three days left in the month, you short ten summerses and you need a collar. Gotta get gotta step up on it. Gotta do it. Now they don't do that. Well, it's gonna come back. <laughs> it's gonna come back. Um, let's talk more about the the documentary because um they, it was it was just a little over an hour, I believe, or just under an hour, and um a lot happened within that time. Um when it comes to New York City, right? I grew up in New York City. You know, a lot of us are not up to no good. You know, it is what it is. You know, especially when it comes to drugs. It's, it's mm-hmm. always, you know, I, I sold drugs when I was 15 years old. Um, I was on 110th Street between uh, Lexington and Park selling heroin at 15 years old. And um, I saw a lot during that time in Harlem, in Spanish Harlem. And we know that there, in, in the city, there's a lot of people doing a lot of things. Yeah. But it's like not everybody that's doing stuff is really a bad person. You know, yeah, it, it's, it's the circumstances that we go into. Um, there's a lot of dynamics that are involved in all of that. But for the most part, people are just trying to do, you know, trying to survive. And, and, and they're trying to do right. But sometimes, you know, the temptation of, uh, or the allure of money can corrupt anybody, especially yeah. when there's no father figures at home and all the other things that are by design, uh, breaking up the family structure and all that. But when it comes to like the, the documentary, when it comes to that, like when you were policing and you, they were telling you to fulfill these quotas, that obviously you, you wasn't going to do. That's why they have the documentary because you guys were the, the ones that were courageous enough to say, hey, no, I'm not going to do this. But when you were pursuing the criminal element or being uh, observant of the criminal element to be aware of, what was some of the or what are some of the things? Because you're still a police officer today, so you're still doing this. Yeah. Um, what are the things that you do look for in regards to that so that you are operating in a righteous manner in the position that you're in? Like, how do you really identify when something illegal is happening amongst the community? Well, one is you, you have to know the area. You have to know who you are. Who is who? If you're in the area, I could go anywhere in the world. And within a few days, I could tell who the dealers, who the shooters and who's the plug just by observation alone. And once you know that, that's who you go after. But like I mentioned earlier, the NYPD doesn't want quality. They want quantity. I remember as a rookie, they we had a guy that had a rape collar. He arrested somebody for a rape. Great, great arrest. But they praised the guy that arrested six teenagers that jumped the turnstile. <laughs> because and the he guy who had the people. rape collar is like, whatever. Yeah. Mm. It, it wasn't, you, it's not like you got seven rapes, you know? <laughs> so it's all about the quantities because the way it works, the more arrests a precinct's having is what boosts that commanding officers to the next rank and the next rank after that. So that's what they want. They want massive, massive arrests. So that's how I handled it. And also building rapport with the community because growing up, we didn't talk to the cops. Like as bad as the 90s were, guys didn't go up to a cop and say, you know, suck my, you know what. Yeah. They just walk past and mind our business. You know, the only time interaction will happen is when they initiate. Now it's a different story. They tell you suck your what, suck their thing. They want your mom to do the same thing. Your daughters Mm. to do the same thing. Their son, your sons. A lot of disrespect in the yeah. right now. That yeah, I have a twenty year old daughter and I noticed that her generation of the kids have so little respect for uh-huh. for their elders, for the adults. Uh when we was growing up, you know, I'm gonna be forty five in a couple of months and um mm-hmm. we had respect. Like, you know, that you just had this certain level of respect you have, but now as the generations have progressed, it's like there's no empathy. What, what mm-hmm. we're seeing right now, I talk a lot about it. I have a, a series called the Narcissism Series. What we're okay. seeing right now through social media and through other uh, channels, we're seeing a steady rise within the younger generations of narcissism, where by 2050, with the way things are going, we're going to have this country is going to be filled with them, mm-hmm. filled with them, where you're just going to have a lot of people walking around that have no empathy whatsoever. Cold, callous, malice mentality. Step yeah. on my mother's neck to to get what I want and to get it now. Very selfish. Um, there's a question I wanted to ask you before I forget. Something that's very concerning in the world, and it's been a big problem for thousands of years. How does the, what's been in your encounters or the police department in New York City's encounters when it comes to pedophilia? How is that handled? Pedophilia, huh? What can I say? We had an officer that worked in my precinct 
and he he was arrested for soliciting a minor by a state trooper. Uh, he got arrested. He basically was uh, he was removed from the command, and you didn't see him for a while. Next thing I know, I read about him in the paper that he was allowed to retire with a 25-year pension. Huh. Why doesn't that surprise me? And I'm like, what? And yet I have a friend that they allege that he was lying over the incident that happened. They have no proof. The witness that said that he did it recanted the statements. The criminal courts found him innocent. And they still fought. And never got, never had a disciplinary problem ever in his whole career. And he got fired. He was forced to resign. And didn't get his pension. Think he won't get his pension until two years from now. That's that draconian network, man, that's here in the United States within all the institutions. It's so... Yeah. And that's where, you know, and, and you you obviously know this, Lamad, Satan. I mean, mm-hmm. Satan r- runs this world, you know? Everything is upside down. And like in the book of Isaiah, where it talks about how they the people have accepted the light for the darkness and the darkness for the light, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I saw that growing up in New York City, but now it's even worse, where it's like the truth is being accepted as the lie. And the lies accepted as the truth. And those that are good liars get rewarded, just like the narcissists. And like Uh you were saying, the ass kissers and all of these types of people, they get rewarded. And the person that does right, the person that's living in that truth, they don't. They get condemned. They get condemned for that behavior. So go back to what you said about the narcissism. That's what really who's running the NYPD are the narcissists. Yeah, absolutely. Because mm-hmm. when you have the police department, it's a sample of society. You can get the wherever you at, you could have people that are race racist, people that are criminals, people that are sex offenders, pedophiles, deviants. And when you say more and more the newer generation, they become more and more narcissistic. So that is gonna be the majority within the department with the next few years, you know. And the mentality they treat, they teach you also in the police academy is every man's for themselves. When you put that mentality out there, it's easier to control the minds of the officers. It destroys the unity, you know, because back in the days, if you heard, if a supervisor is based in with, one, uh, with a cop, the whole command was shut down. And when they all shut down, this commanding officer was going on and said, well, this guy's doing X, Y, and Z. Guess what happened? That supervisor would be shipped out. And everything will run business as usual. So since they figured out, Satan taught them that if you make people be selfish, it's easy to control them. Reward their selfishness so they can continue being a narcissist, continue thinking about themselves, continually drawing their fellow police officers under the under the bus. Yeah. And statistically throughout America, especially in the corporatocracy and corporation, um, narcissists are always going to make more money than anybody else. Doesn't matter what industry you're in, um, they get rewarded. Where if you have empathy and you have sensitivity, um, you're not going to make as much money in your field of industry statistically within the United States because the narcissist is always going to be higher. And like you were saying, they're going to be rewarded for that selfishness because they're willing to compromise morality mm-hmm. to the to the end goal. I've seen it within the insurance industry that I came from in corporate America, where it was like there were people that was like they would look just like how in the police department. I was thinking this when I was watching Crime and Punishment, mm-hmm. like how the officer was driving with the other brother. I forgot his name. Abdullah. Abdullah. Yeah. OK, so remember that scene where. He's like, hey, I'm going to go get you a collar. Like, oh, I got you a collar. Collar, collar, collar. Collar, collar, right? And it was the Mm -hmm. same thing in sales. You know, there's these, there'd be agents that they just look at somebody, pull up to somebody's home or or to a business. And they're like, oh, yeah, we're going to get them. We're going to get that sale. We're going to get that sale. And I'm like, let's see, you know, when I used to approach people, if I'm going to sell them an insurance policy, first, I want to see if they're interested in it. Mm-hmm. Second, if it's something that is doable for them, and I'm going to also tell them what's in the fine print, mm-hmm. where other agents that were money hungry, it's like, sign here, do this. They're going to tell that person whatever they got to tell them to get the sale, to meet that quota, to to get that promotion, to get the vacation, to get whatever, you know? And it's a very thin line, too, when you're in that industry, you know? Same thing when you're in the police. It's like you're being put under pressure, like the sister in the in the documentary where 
she didn't like that feeling of saying, I got to get an arrest. I got to get, mm -hmm. you know, I got to get some, some summonses out, you know, and, and having that pressure, you start to become desperate. And then that desperation leads to you doing something that's immoral, something yeah. that's unrighteous. And then it weighs on you. It weighs on your spirit, you know? Yeah. It really does. And that stress right there affects your mental health. Uh, article came out a few days ago in the New York Post about mental health of the police officers. And we talk, touched on it a little bit about suicide. Basically having the pressure that if you don't get your numbers, you're going to get punished. You also is going to have that pressure on your head constantly. It's going to affect your family life, you know. And by you affecting your family life, you could either become abusive to your, your significant other, your wife or husband, and your children, which will lead to divorce. And divorce costs money. It's just your city employment. That 17% is covered out regardless what you do it. It's going to come out the amount that they want. It's not covered out pre-tax. It's covered out post-tax. Net. I know guys that was paid child support, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars a month. Hey, I was paying thirty three percent. I was paying thirty three percent of my income. Wow, that's yeah, that's half your check. <laughs> half of it goes to taxes, and I, I so wasn't making a lot of money at the time. Fifty percent neither. of your checks. I wasn't making a lot of money at the time, neither. You know, but that's that draconian law of of the United States, man. It's just, especially if you're a person that is not considered of the economic uh, social construct of the color code being white. Mm -hmm. And it's it's something I think is a misconception a lot because I heard it being thrown around in um in the documentary. A lot of people think that a minority is a black person or a Latino person or a person of color. But what they don't realize is that the term minority doesn't mean that. It actually means the person with the least wealth in the country. Exactly. So it just so happens to be people of color. But even white people in certain neighborhoods are also considered minority because mm -hmm. the majority is the people with the majority of wealth. And power. Exactly. But a lot of people, they always, they use that word minority. They toss it around like, oh, I'm a minority. It's like, but do you really know what that means? That doesn't mean you're black. That means mm -hmm. that you hold the minority of wealth within this nation, within this yeah. corporation. I'm, I'm, I learned that in high school. I had an Asian friend and she was telling me that she couldn't qualify for financial aid. I was like, ain't you a minority? And she's like, no, according to this, I'm not a minority. And I was like, what do you mean? So now when you look at the Constitution and all these uh, laws, they always say race, color. I was like, isn't race and color one and the same? No, it's not. It's not one and the same. So it's like you said earlier, it's a racial construct because back in the days, it was not based on your skin color. It's where your people's from. A Jew was a Jew, no matter where he was born. You That's know? right. If you're Irish, you're Irish, no matter where you was born. That's your people. But to further confuse everything and create what you call an America, they took out the Irish, the Scottish, the Italians and made them white. That's right. To unify everybody. That's right. Because in Europe, it was a, it was white, but you, you Irish, you believe you below me, you German, you're above me and so forth and so on. So it's this country, the idea of whiteness and all the racial purity laws that they had was what Nazi Germany used during their Holocaust and what it was doing their segregation thing over there. So it's it's crazy. I'm glad you pulled out that point about the minority. It's based on wealth and power. Okay. And based on those two constructs, we are minorities. And it goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. You know, they should be the head and we should be the tech. They shall lend and we shall borrow. Now, yeah. talk, talking about crime and punishment, which is for those that are listening, um, Lamad, also known as Richie Baez, who's one of the officers in the documentary. If you haven't checked it out, people definitely check it out. It's a great documentary. Um, it's called Crime Plus Punishment. And um, in that documentary, um, I noticed that you weren't um, you weren't filmed on the job. At all, right? I, I I don't think they I ever was. filmed you in uniform. I was. It's, it was very fast. Very brief. It must have been extremely brief. brief because I've seen that documentary like five times. <laughs> and I don't remember once seeing you in the field. Yeah, I had glasses and working with Sandy Gonzalez. We coming out the car and we give somebody a summons. Oh, okay. That must have been very brief. That was like, was what, like a, a five second clip or something in the movie? Maybe like a two second clip. <laughs> <laughs> so why was that? Why weren't you filmed like other officers that were part of the the 12 that was on the job? Well, I was filmed a lot. I was hey. filmed a lot. Okay. And 
So it's like the way Steve wanted to do the story. And Steve is a master storyteller, very talented. He went that way and he went with things that he felt that was more impactful. And also, I never got a chance to do like a, a one off piece, like the way Derek did, the way Felicia's did, yeah. the way Pedro Serrano did, the way Edward Raymond. But it's like I was then never able to do it. So, and by the way, who the, the, the person he's talking about, Steve, his name is Steve Ming. Steve Ming. Yeah, yeah, he's the actual director of the documentary. Uh, For those that don't know, Steve Ming, look him up. Um, Yeah, I just I I I thought maybe those scenes were edited, you know, and taken out that were filmed because that's usually what happens with a film. You're gonna take whatever portions of all the film that you did and edit it to fit whatever theme. So he probably took out some of the scenes that you were in um, to fit a certain theme that he wanted to convey in the film, which I think it was a pretty great film. I wish it lasted longer. But yeah, I, th- I think it was like two hours. The film. No, it, it, it's not. It's not. It, uh, the it wasn't actually two hours. It's actually an hour. An hour? Yeah, yeah. The documentary wasn't long at all. Um, okay, I could one was like two hours. Well, you saw you saw it on Hulu. Yeah. Or uh, yeah, YouTube? I saw it okay. on Hulu. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I think I believe it was like 59 minutes to, to be exact or just a little over an hour, just a little over 60, to, if I remember I need, correctly. Yeah, I had to look at it again. Maybe they cut off scenes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But going back to the documentary, um, what has come out of it? Because I know that from watching it, the lawsuit that you guys wanted to put through didn't get approved. The a judge said that it was not constitutional or wasn't there wasn't anything that that um, that held weight in in the lawsuit that you guys wanted to file correct it got denied what what the judge said that we should never went to the federal it should have been handled (laughs) in-house okay because because (laughs) we had (laughs) we have things in-house that could take care of it which showed that the judge didn't read it because we all made complaints in-house and nothing was taken care of. If anything, it made everything 10 times worse. And when you mentioned, you can't have a corrupt person uh, to correct himself, to police himself. It's not going to happen. Yeah. And one thing that the movie uh, uh, private investigator Manuel Gomez, he said he wants to create a department called Department of Civilian Justice. So it'll give them prosecutor powers and subpoena power to help officers and civilians that's going through the same things that we're going through. He currently has that legislation at state level in New York, I think either North or South Carolina, and the Southeast Arizona, New Mexico, and Connecticut going on right now. So hopefully it comes through. We try to create a federal bill that's going nationwide, and that not only covers uh, NY police officers or corrections, firefighters, district attorneys, and other law enforcement uh, personnel. So what do you think? Uh, uh, To go back on the lawsuit, it's still pending. Okay. What happened recently was, mind you, this thing's been going on for almost 10 years now, this lawsuit. What happened is right now that out of the 12, they kept four. Me, Pedro, Sandy, and Edwin Raymond. They kept four of us. And recently, the federal lawsuit was federal judge only kept Pedro and Sandy on the federal level because they said that their First Amendment uh, rights were violated because Pedro, he went to stop and frisk trial, the Floyd v. New York. That basically said the way stop for fix was being used was illegal. He's testifying. And based on that, his punishment was was gained and was being dealt me out. Me and Raymond never testified on trial. So our First Amendment rights wasn't being affected. So what the judge said to kick it back in the state level. So now we started the process over in the state level. Why were the other eight officers that were part of the 12 taken off? Uh, either statute of limitation, like based on the complaints, has ran out. Yeah. Because some of them have pre- other lawyers that, and I can mention names, I'll tell you off camera, uh, don't mess with that lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he took your money and ran, ran with it, you know? So that's usually what happened. And other paperwork errors that wasn't done in a timely fashion. How about the private investigator that was ex, uh, ex NYPD? Um, oh, man, go, this guy is freaking uh, amazing, man. He really is, uh, man. He does. He really does some really good righteous work, man. Yeah, he currently freed like over twenty or thirty people in the state of New York that was wow. wrongfully accused of crimes that they did not commit. Let's give him a round of applause, man. We got to give. We got to give because I was watching it again, and I was just like, man, this guy is truly fearless. So. 
we definitely got to give um, a, 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 a nice round of applause to Manny Gomez for making sure that brothers get to live their life, you know, and not having lives destroyed. He's saving lives. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Salute to Manny Gomez, man, doing some good work. Um, so, okay, so they took off eight. They left four of you. Only mm-hmm. left two on the federal level. Yeah. Um, obviously, whenever a documentary comes out like this, um, and it's why I love documentary films, that's why I want to be a documentarian filmmaker, is because it changes, it, it, it can really impact lives. It really brings a great amount of education to people. Since that documentary has been filmed, has it created any significant change that you've been able to witness since the film came out within the communities of New York City, within the police department or any significant change that you can recall that's that's present today? Well, I won't say change, but the adjustments that they made. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, They did training called the 20K training. Basically, they retrain us how to police, how to interact with the public. That happened literally like months after we came out of our lawsuit accusing of the tactics that they're using. Uh, They basically put, when the film came out, the film came out, we had the the former president of the Sergeant Benevolent Association show up at the film premiere and... Park City, Utah, where they have the what's it? Sundance Film Festival. Okay. So you saw when it actually premiered, he saw it. And our job being my job, they had Eternal Affairs following us, you know, tra- tracing every uh, move that we do, probably recording our, tapping into our live series right now, reporting back to headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they basically start changing the procedure be- before it was no such thing that we can, it was no uh, uh, put, uh, department uh, rule that we cannot record. Now they put that, like recording uniform and doing anything. Now they put that. They also put in writing that a supervisor should not ask for quarter base activity or performance or any other thing. They put that in the rules. So those are the adjustments that they did. I won't say changes. Because they're still asking for it. They just put that in the guide just to see why. It's like uh, that saying, they put lipstick on a pig, you know, yeah, it's, but it's, it's still a pig. It's a, whore. <laughs> it's a whore pretending to be a lady, you know? <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that quote. It's a whore pretending to be a lady. Um, have And I know I asked you this offline, but I'll ask you now um, for the show. How have you been treated personally amongst your peers since the uh, film uh, since the film aired? Peers, uh, the ones I worked with and they saw what was happening to me was happening to them. So the ones that like by day one, so it was like, listen, if they would have just taken me and put them, it would be the same story. Yeah. The same exact story, you know. And how this job has ruined so many people's lives in regards to their relationship, their marriages, their relationship with their children, friendships. is like it creates like a this dark darkness inside of you that you can't really shake. And you can only relate to other police officers, which is really scary when you can only relate to people that you work with. You know, that's not part of our social makeup. That's not what God made us to be. You know, you should be able to interact with people regardless of their work, you know, and also by you having that disconnect, they can only interact or relate to police officers. How can you serve the community of people that are not police officers, that are not in the greatest social economic standards or political standards? It creates a, a disconnect. It creates a divide and conquer. It creates this us versus them mentality. So that is, in essence, what still remains. Now, people that were the Kool-Aid drinkers, you know, of course, they talk their they trash. They will never say in front of my face. <laughs> they will never say in front of my face, but they will talk, definitely talk behind my back. We had, excuse me, we had one supervisor like trying to intimidate me, was screaming at me and took the step like, you know, like some street stuff, like took a step to me, like trying to get my face. And I said very politely, I said, hey, that's not what happened. And I took a step towards him. But, you know, not aggressive, but to let him know that, yo, if you want it, you could get it. <laughs> it, it. 
So that's what he thought that by me coming on TV, by me making a documentary, by me making the complaint that I'm, so t- um, I'm a coward. I didn't have no type of backbone. I got yellow stripes going down my back. But I'm just doing that little body actions, like you said, things that you learn out in the world, things that you learn in the streets to let people know like, hey, I'm not going to, I'm not looking for a problem, but I'm not backing down. He backed down. He didn't realize that, okay, I'm about it. Uh, what they really hurt me was financially. Because I was like the way overtime is to supplement your your income because our pay is so terrible is by doing overtime. So they allowed you to do a double, meaning that you work your regular tour and then you do a post tour at, um, overtime. According to the department procedure, you can't do that, working a double. But they let everybody else do it. But with me, they apply the rules. They want me to work on my days off. My days off was the Sabbath. I'm not going to break the Sabbath to do overtime. So that's how they really affect police office uh, affected me. Also, they removed me from the midnights to the day tours. The midnights gives you uh, that night differential, which is additional, in my case, maybe like twelve to $13,000 a year. Wow, it's that's significant. Yeah. You know, so just calculate that over 10 years that I haven't been getting it, plus the overtime significantly, you know, significantly. So that's how they uh, hurt me. And also breaking me up with my partner. You know, me and my, me have been partners for over 10 years and we know each other. It's like we don't even have to talk to know something's going on or how we're going to react with something. We just know off the back. And that increases your safety and your, comf- your comfort level. So the likelihood of you killing somebody by accident is practically eliminated because you have that comfort level. You have that understanding. The tactic is on one accord. It's precise, pristine because you move faster while communicating than communicating if you know each other. If you know what I mean, uh, if you if you don't understand, ask me. Uh, tell me, I can uh, I can simplify it. So by taking that element out, now I work with a new guy, a rookie. So I'm teaching the rookie the ropes and explaining how to do this. It's all about your tactics and the approach. You have to use this, you know, and don't rush into anything. Take your time. Take your time talking. Take your time to think. Take your time to react. And once you do that enough, it becomes second nature. So they broke me up from that person. So it just kept me isolated. And they basically gave me like a, what you can call it, like assignments that keep me isolated from everybody. So they don't want me to influence people. And that's how they think they're winning. But in reality, they're not because people still ask me for advice. And I tell them what they need to do, you know, to basically not to get yourself in trouble because they still want your numbers. Just don't do it just for the number. Just do it because that was the thing to do at that time. Use your discretion. And that's the key thing they didn't like about me. I use my discretion. If you had a chance to do it all over again, would you change anything? Considering uh, everything you've been through? Let me see. Will I change anything? No. Okay, so you would do it the same exact way that you went into it the first time. I'll go because what they hated about me was my faith. You know, they got this freaking... <laughs> Dominican, black, Dominican Jew having Friday, Saturdays off. You know, I could keep my facial hair. Uh, when they try to attack me about my faith, I say, yo, this, I won't back down. I went out back down and say, no, this is my faith. If you're going to say, do something, I'm going to make a complaint. And I had a supervisor. He tried to insult me and I switched it on him. He said, and, oh, well, you stupid. You know how to use a co- uh, Xerox copier? I looked at him. I said, yes, I don't know how to use it. Can you teach me? <laughs> He's like, oh. <laughs> 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 and he said, oh, you don't like my sense of humor? I said, I don't joke around supervisors. He kicks me out of his office, calls me 20 minutes later. He says, I know who you are. You have Friday, Saturdays off. Next thing you know, he changed my uh, my st- my religious observance and gives me a, a scooter chart, means that it rotates. So that means I only have Friday, Saturdays off maybe every other three months. So I won't be able to keep the Sabbath anymore. So I made, a co- I made a complaint about it and got taken care of very fast. They didn't like it. Uh, another thing they used to do to punish us, you ever seen those things? It's called a sky watch. Disney has it a lot too. Basically what it is, is it lifts you up all the way up in the sky. Yeah, It looks yeah. like something from uh, Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I've the, seen those at uh, the Walmarts. Yeah. The most useless thing in law enforcement is that thing. <laughs> It's the most useless thing. It's all. It's just about a, uh, a show. So people think, oh, it's police presence. They used to do that as a punishment post. Because in the middle of winter, it was no heat. And they want you up there. Oh. And the window's broken. Oh, man. So you up there with no heat. And and 
and I made a complaint against. I made an OSHA complaint against it, and <laughs> like any public uh, agency, it took forever. I made a complaint like in November. They didn't show up to January, so the thing wasn't there no more. So they were saying, "Oh, it got fixed." And guess who fixed it? Allegedly, was the brother of the commanding officer that was punishing us. Oh wow! So like I said, he was connected. You know that both of them are chiefs, the McCormick brothers, chiefs. So. After in January, it came back in February. Exact same thing. Windows broken. The heat is not working. Total mess. Mm, mm, mm. How do the people now? Since you you're kind of somewhat a little famous now because you you've been on you know <laughs> you've been on TV and you're on Hulu and I'm pretty sure that documentary's gone all throughout the world, but specifically in New York City. How do the locals in the community treat you? Like, do they, do they people that actually stop you and say, hey, you're the guy from from that documentary? Do you get that a lot? You know what? Surprisingly, I don't get a lot. Okay. Uh, but the ones that do, they thank me because they recognize me. Because Crime and Punishment is one of those documentaries that won so many awards. We won an Emmy. You know, we got on stage. We have Trayvon Martin on stage with us and we gave all a little speech. Uh, Sundance. We went to different colleges. We went all over the world with this, even to Europe, Denmark and London. But it's one of those things that most people in the in the city never saw. And why you most think black is that? and brown people have not seen. Why you think is that? What, what what is that because they just they don't they can't afford Hulu or like <laughs> What well, do you think it is? I think because it's, it's, that might be one reason. Because Hulu is only like in the, I think in the Americas. It's not in Europe or in Asia, like Netflix. And like Roku. And like Roku. Yeah. So that's one of the things that I think hinder it. And also the promotion of it. It wasn't promoted as heavily, like just say, like a like an Avenger movie. So so basically the people that seen it is really because of word of mouth. You know, so by like people on your on your platform promoting it. Yeah, and well, this is gonna to this it. is gonna go to Roku. So a lot of people mm-hmm. are gonna see this from around the world. Um, going to Roku. Yeah, this this particular interview that we're doing right now is not gonna just be on my international podcast where you can listen to it audibly, but I'm actually have this visually on my TV channel. Oh, great, yeah. great, and stuff like that. Like I said, it helped promote the film, promote the awareness about how police interact with the community and. To give a tip, if you feel like a, a police officer is abusing their authority against you, best thing is, is not take it to the street level. You're going to lose. You're going to lose and nothing really could be done about it. Just stay calm, look at their name or you can ask for their name, the name and badge number and make a complaint. And the key thing, once you make the complaint, follow up and keep following up. Because one thing about people where it says we got when the Lord says that we're like solid children, that means that we are spoiled brats. This is saying the simplest, nicest thing that we want things instant gratification. If the punishment is not done right then and there, we lose interest. Follow up. Uh, look at the people, the these Nazi hunters. They go into these Nazi uh, former Nazis war criminals that's like 110 years old on oxygen masks being carried on stretcher to face justice for what they did. That's called patience. That calls perseverance. And that goal, never give up and never forget. Take that mentality and dealing with everything we do in life, especially in the scriptures and also how to handle corrupt cops, you know, and that's basically it. And also uh, one thing with police officers, the safer we feel, the less, less likely that the interaction between the police officer and that person is going to escalate to violence. You, know. you heard it here, folks. Stay calm. Something I talk about a lot on my show. I talked about my experiences out here in Florida is one thing that um, how I behave, even when I was in New York or especially New Jersey, because that's where some of my worst experiences were in New Jersey. Um, almost be emotionless. That's how I look at it. It's like have no emotion. Just be cold and, and calm. To where it's like almost like you're a functional zombie is what I call it, where it's like you're not giving the police anything to go off of. Because one thing I've noticed when I was growing up is like, depending on how you respond to them, you're like, hey, what's your attitude? Why are you being a smart ass or this and that, you know? But when you're not giving any emotion to the police officer, then there's not really much that they can use against you when it comes to that psychological warfare that a lot of our brothers and sisters fall victim to. 
because they, like you said, don't take it to the streets. You're not going to win. You're not, you know, especially when it's like when a lot of these people be like, um, you know, what am I being detained for? It's, It's okay to ask that, but it's how you ask it. It's a lot of things that go into it. But when you start catching an attitude and this and that, it's like you're just setting yourself up for a world of problems. And sometimes you might not make it, you know, yeah. you might get killed. You might literally get killed. Yeah. Before we started having body cameras, which the car stops, I always tell them, I always ID myself and I always tell them why I stopped them. And nine out of 10 times, it diffuses everything. And, you know, sometimes people try to antagonize me because we got a lot of professional antagonizers there. Their whole job, the whole job is to antagonize you, get a cop, get me to basically react and by cursing you out, hitting you so I can make a complaint and then they can sue me and make money off of it. There's an industry for that. Yeah. The people that actually do that. There's a lot of car artists so, out there. Exactly. So. Even when they film me and try to antagonize me, by me being cool and calm and explain everything, after a few seconds, they just turn off the phone and they just hear. <laughs> and that comes with being professional. Yeah. Um, the question I wanted to ask, you have over 18 years of experience. Um, yeah. What would be an ideal situation from your perspective if you were able, if like, let's say they said, they go, Richie, we're going to give you full control to reorganize the whole entire institution of the New York City Police Department. Whatever you, however you want to structure it, we're going to give you full reign. Mm-hmm. How would you ideally structure the police department to run and function? Well, the first thing would be every police officer that leaves the academy, they have to go to a breezy company. I mean, precinct. They have to come to the South Bronx, like the four row. 4-4, which is, uh, I think, the high bridge. The 4-6 was university. Uh, they got the 4-8, which covers uh, Tremont, T-Bow, and those areas. Those very b- busy areas. Soundview, East New York, Brownsville. Have them be there for the first five years of their careers. And only on patrol. So they could so they could see what it is to be in a very busy precinct. And after those five years... They can opt to go to a different command that's slower, that's less busy, like Drosnick or Riverdale, (laughs) or they go to a specialized unit. By doing that, that mental burnout is taken away because now they got new scenery. That's one thing. Uh, The next thing is when a person gets promoted, they should go to a board to see if they have leadership quality. Because being a boss and being a leader is two different things, you know, like uh, the word obey, obedience. And submission is similar, but it's completely different. Obedience is this. Okay, or uh, you're my supervisor. I got to do it. I'll do it, but I don't want to do it. And I'm going to do it when I feel like doing it. <laughs> you know, submission is like, oh, that's my man, Aura. All right, cool, man. You know, that's 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 the guy right there. Let's do it. And let's do the best possible job we could possibly do. You know, and you can put it spiritually. Under Christ, we're under his submission. We're doing it willingly with joy. Under Moses, it's just obedience. Because one of the things that is mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 28 is because we refuse to do it with gladness and joyness of heart to serve the Lord. We didn't want to submit. We only did it because it's the Sabbath. We can't cook. We can't work. We can't sell. <sighs> How many hours before is the Sabbath ends? Submission. Oh, it's a Sabbath. Yo, let me call my peoples. Let's go over scriptures. Let's go to Sabbath service. It's a joy. It's the acceptance. So put them before the board and to see if they have leadership quality. It used to be done back in the days, but they took it out because a lot of black and Latinos were scoring very high on their promotional exam. But when they go before the board, they say they couldn't articulate themselves. Because at that time, the board was all white. <laughs> it was all white. So when you meet those officers that say couldn't articulate themselves, you're like, what do you mean they can't articulate? These guys are like the best. They're speaking like Malcolm X. They're speaking like uh, <laughs> Martin Luther King. Very articulate. Yeah. You know, great orators. So they took it out because they said it was, it was racist, which it was. Now you can put people different backgrounds there do that. Two, there's something that the commanding officer has. It's this unlimited power that could give you punishment. So it's to really punish you based on how he fits, see fit. Not because you broke any particular rules, but he feels like giving it to you. That needs to be taken away. Uh, the promotion above captain is discretionary. Take that out. Let it be an exam. And also uh, let the community be part of selection to see if that person can go up to the next level. 
Mm, so, I like that one, right? Because based on the fruits of the spirit, right? Based on their yeah. works and deeds and the exactly. community will be able to know, hey, this guy's done right and done things the right way so he can move up. How would you uh, structure the misconduct? Would, would you have it still be internal affairs or how would you take care of that? Well, depends what it is, the seriousness. If it's something minor, keep it in house. If it's something serious, go to a different agency, like the Department of Civilian Justice. So you would want to institute that within the reorganization of the institution? Yes. Okay. Anything else that you want to add to that? Uh, let me see. I'll definitely change the set working five days a week, eight, eight and a half hours. I'll make a three day work week, 12 hours and four days off. Oh, like because, nurses. Yeah. So that way you have more quality time with your family, more time to recharge yourself, you know, also like a uh, paid uh, work to be to work out. You know, you get like an hour pre tour or post tour to work out. That makes sense because I've seen a lot of police officers that are out of shape. Yeah, I'm out of shape. <laughs> <laughs> I love this shit. Yeah, but I've seen some guys, man, that are they they look like they can't they 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 they're gonna be out of breath walking up one flight of stairs, man. Yeah, I mean that and also a physical test uh twice a year. So you know, keep people up at par and really take their job seriously. Okay. Um this is gonna be my last question. Um you know, being a child of Israel like we are, mm -hmm. what do you think that's done for you in key and in, in, in regards to the profession that you're in being a police officer in the largest police force in the world? What has your faith in the most high and the word of the most high? What has that done for you in the in your as as far as your profession? Like if you can let the people know what the most high has done for you being in the position that you've been in doing the work that you've done, putting yourself out there like no other officers have done. You are a very, very small group of officers that have done something that most officers have never done. Um, what has that done for you being, you know, what has the most high done for you in regards to that? It's, it's something that you said earlier about the chosen 12. When I found those 12 of us, I say, okay, this is the most high. <laughs> yeah. This is the most high. 12 disciples, 12, uh, 12 months, 12 tribes. This is the most high. And what we was doing is monumental in the sense that we're doing the David Goliath thing. The NYPD is a monster. It's something they teach in the academy. It's a monster. It's a boogeyman. Do not upset the monster. The monster will come and kill you and eat you up. We expose that monster. It's just a whore pretending to be a lady. And knowing that everything they try to throw at me has not broken me, even by trying to set me up to facing phone calls that, oh, I didn't do X, Y, and Z, or try and get me in trouble, or claiming that I was sleeping while I wasn't sleeping. The most high protected me, protected me, and nothing has touched me. The only thing that really touched me was the overtime, but even with that, the most high opening doors in ways that people just can't believe it. I had a supervisor come up to me and say, yo, man, I see they, they throwing everything they can at you and it's not affecting you at all. And like I said earlier, if I had a chance to do it all over again, I'll do it exactly the way I'm doing it right now. I wouldn't change a thing. All praise to the most high for that. Um, yeah. Okay, so with that being said, any last um, final comments to leave the listeners with? Anything you want to um, say, mention? Well, if anyone wants to join law enforcement, do it, do it, especially NYPD, because you'll learn a lot. It's a great stepping stone. If you don't like it, you can leave it. And it's a great stepping stone to go someplace else. And with this uh, on your resume, people are glad you take you anywhere, you know. Uh, to have faith in the most high and always stand up for what's right. Always be around like-minded people, people that fear the most high, just like Daniel was with the uh, with Shadrach, uh, Meshach, and Abednego. They were together. And never feel you're alone. You're never alone. You're outnumbered, but you're never alone. And keep the faith, man. Keep the faith. The most High doesn't give you anything you can't handle. No, oh, well said. Well said. Well, people, you've heard it here from Brother Lamont, also known as Richie Baez. He is one of the chosen 12 in the documentary on Hulu. It's called Crime and Punishment. It's about the New York City uh, Police Department and the corruption behind um, uh, forcing officers to issue illegal citations. Check it out if you haven't. 
And uh, I want to thank you, brother, for coming on the show. I think that you provided an enormous amount of wealth of information in regards to spirituality and especially in regards to how, you know, the police department in New York City is perceived and what it's really all about. Not not all the police officers are bad. All right. Um, you just have a, a, an institution that is somewhat run in a manner that is not uh, conducive to society being, uh, you know, so society being respected as it should. Um, they're looked at as as cattle, as numbers, as meat for the slaughter. And uh, we need more brothers like you in our police departments when policing because uh, you're saving lives, you know, and you're inspiring people to to be courageous. So you're, you're being the faithful friend, you know, within the police department. So I want to thank you again for coming on the show. And um, like I always say, brothers and sisters, um, you know, when you live in the present, there's always an opportunity for a new beginning. And also, don't look for the light at the end of the tunnel because the light is and always will be within you. So I want to say peace and blessings. Shout outs to everybody that's listening. Peace and blessings to all the brothers and sisters in the NYPD, all the people out in New York City. And also, um, keep your head up out there, man. It's hard, but we can all make it happen. And um, as long as we keep our faith in the Most High and in the Messiah and, you know, put one righteous foot in front of the other. So this is Aura the Informationalist from the Network of Awareness saying peace, love, and light, brothers and sisters. Includes the Network of Awareness podcast. For more information on the Network of Awareness, please subscribe via email to our website, networkofawareness.com, and follow us on Spreaker.com or any other listening apps you use. For any questions about the NOA, email us at aura at networkofawareness.com. Thank you for listening to one of the fastest growing podcast shows on society and culture in America and abroad. When you live in the present, there's always an opportunity for a new beginning. Peace and blessings. Peace and blessings.